Good morning, beautiful people. So excited to be in the house this morning. Song says, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met I was breathing, but I alive all my failures I've tried to hide it will smart till I'm there you come my name Nice crowd of kids today. I don't know if my mic's on. It's on? Good. So guys, I get to be here today. I get to preach. Um, so I'm excited. Meredith's been preaching on stewardship for the last three weeks, and we have a four-week series. What I love about Westminster is that um, stewardship does not mean preaching on money for four weeks, which I've been in lots of churches where that's exactly what that means. It's a month of money talks. Um, and we don't do that at Westminster. You know, we talk about the whole person 
and what it is that God has given us that we should be stewarding well. So the first week, Meredith talked about our time. She talked about how our time is our biggest resource that we need to use wisely. She talked about the parable of the talons, which said that pretty much we own nothing that we have. It's all a loan from God that he has given us to steward well. It's all God's. And then last week, she did talk about money and just the concept of, are you stewarding your finance as well? Do you know where your finances are going? And are you making choices that fit within what you believe and why you believe it? And so this week is our last sermon in the series. And so we decided to talk about spiritual gifts. Because as you begin to think about what God has given you, if you're a believer, then God has given you spiritual gifts that are innate within you. When you accept Jesus as your Savior and believe that he is your Savior, then the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. And then the Holy Spirit allows us to have unique gifts that God has given us, each of us. The Bible says that at least that every person has at least one spiritual gift. Many have many spiritual gifts. And we, as a body of believers, are called to actually use those for the glory of God and for the growth of his kingdom. And so when we think about this, each of us have to figure out what our spiritual gifts are. And sometimes we don't even, we don't know what they are because nobody has guided us in that direction. Um, there's a few ways that you can tell what your spiritual gifts are. One is if you love doing something, if you just enjoy it, it's natural for you, you're just good at it, that might be an implication that that is a spiritual gift that you have. If somebody has come up to you and somebody you trust and respect that you know is a discerning person and says, I see this in you, you're really gifted at this. That's another good sign that that might be a spiritual gift. Another one is taking an assessment. They have lots of spiritual gift assessments on the website, on, on like websites. Um, Meredith and I uh, have found one that we think is pretty well done. And so um, it's on your papers that I gave you. But you can take an assessment and that will give you an idea of what your spiritual gifts are. And sometimes when you take those assessments, you get something you're like, um, I don't really see that in me. I don't know where that came from. Uh, and then somebody who is discerning in your life might be able to say, you don't think it's there, but it actually is. Um, and so that's been helpful. So definitely taking an assessment might be a blessing to you on that. We had a whole series probably like five years ago, right before Jeff left on spiritual gifts, and we encouraged everybody in the church to take an assessment, and a lot of people did. And it was really cool to get to see all of people, everybody's spiritual gifts, to see how we could plug them into different places. It was a little humorous, too, because um, as we joke, we have a lot of lawyers in the church, and we ended up having a lot of administrative people in um, the church at that time. Now, we've added people, we've lost people over the last five years, and so our spiritual gifts, the guide of what we probably have, is drastically different than what we had five years ago in our church. So um, it's important for us to figure that out to see how we best can serve. And so um, it's important that we know what it is that we're doing, because spiritual gifts don't just happen. Like in the sense of, if you have a preacher that you see is really gifted at preaching, he's 20 years into his career, I will promise you that his first year, two years of sermons, maybe even three or four, were not close to as good as his 20-year sermons. If you see a teacher who's a really gifted teacher, professor, I can assure you the first time they taught and on, it was not their best as what they are 20 years in. Because as we use our gifts, we become more proficient at them. We become better at them. God can use us in bigger ways as we continue to cultivate what those gifts are. You know, Meredith asked me for a title, and I'm not good at coming up with titles, but for the second service, you have to have a title for your sermon. And I thought about it for a day or so, and um, something came to mind that was a quote, and I didn't even know whose it was, but with great, um, well, let me think of it. I actually wrote that down because I, I had it, but with great... Yes, with great power comes great responsibility. And it just popped into my mind that day. With great power comes great responsibility. And I don't know if any of you know who said that, but I had to look it up. It was Winston Churchill. And he was not talking about this, of course. But that quote fits so well with what we're talking about today because God has given us an incredible power of the Holy Spirit within us. And so the things that we can do because of that spirit within us are amazing but we have to steward that gift. 
It's a great responsibility, and we have to realize that because sometimes we easily become just living our lives. And if we happen to use a gift that we're good at, great. I feel good about that. But that is not what God wants from us. God wants us to be intentional about finding ways to serve where we can use our gifts. God wants us to be listening to him so that we can see when he's opening up a door for us to be able to use our gifts because it's important. And so in scripture, I have two passages that I want us to look at that, that really give an, a good overview of um, kind of spiritual gifts in, in the Bible. But um, I'm actually reading from the message, so you'll just want to look on the screen. I just like the way the message kind of spoke these two passages that we're going to be looking at. So um, I'll read it to you. Let's see. It is 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Get my eyeballs working. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows how God, who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits all the kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All of these gifts have a common origin, but the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Right after that passage... Paul begins to talk about what it looks like as a body of believers to use our spiritual gifts. And Paul says that we are all one body. And as this passage just said, everybody has unique gifts. No one's alike. We don't even want people to be all alike. It would not work out if everyone had the same gifts. And so what Paul says is we're all one body. And in a body, every part of the body matters. Every part of the body is needed to work the way it was supposed to work. Now, yes, can a body work without a hand? By all means. But it's not working to the ultimate way that it was supposed to work. And then Paul goes on to say that um, even those parts of the body that you don't see, say your heart, say your liver, those parts that actually keep us alive and you can't live without them, those are pretty vital to our ability to survive. And so Paul's saying, you know, those Gifts that you kind of maybe are on the background, those people who are behind the scenes, those gifts are just as important as the gifts of the people right up front. And so I don't know if there was something going on back in that time that Paul felt like that people maybe were jealous of other gifts. People didn't recognize their gifts because they weren't standing out in front of everybody. So maybe you thought, oh, that's not a gift. That's just me. That's just, that's just something I can do. I don't know. But Paul definitely stressed that here a lot. In fact, in the second verse, in the second chapter that I'm going to read to y'all out of Ephesians, it's the same thing. He addresses this same topic of understanding that every gift is important and we have to go with what God gives us. We can't be looking at somebody else and wondering what they have and wanting what they have. We have to look at what God has given us that is innate within us. And then we've got to use that because it matters. Because as a body functions, the body of Christ also only functions well if everybody is doing their part that God has called them to. So let's read our Ephesians passage. It's Ephesians 4, 4 through 15. Let's see here. You who are called to travel on the same road and in the same direction to say together both outwardly and inwardly, you have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who rules over, works through all and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is premeditated with oneness. But that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. The text for this is, he climbed the high mountain, he captured the enemy and seized the booty, he handed it all out in the gifts to the people. It's true, is it not, that the one who climbed up also climbed down, down to the valley of earth, and the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up to the highest heaven. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, 
teacher to train Christians in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in the response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within, within and without, fully alive in Christ. So he touches on the fact that we all have our unique gifts, but what I love is that last little section. I want you to hear it really closely. He says, Christians in skilled servant work, working with Christ's body, the church right here, the church, until we're moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in the response to God's son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive in Christ. So pretty much what he said is until we as believers are all living out our gifts that we've been called to give, to use, and that we are talented at, and that God has a plan for us with those, until we're all using our gifts to the fullest, we are not working in rhythm as a body of believers in your church. But let's look at the world. If every Christian was living out their gifts and living those out in the community and people around, imagine how well things would run and how much people would see God in the midst of that. Because part of our gifts reveal who God is. When somebody sees us using those and they see our gifts and they see our talents, whether it's something amazing like a miracle or whether it's something that people are just kind and loving and generous, that causes people to see God's power. And when people see God's power, they become interested in who this God is. And so it's important as we continue to live out our lives and use our gifts that we realize that it is truly a rhythmic dance of what is happening and what God is trying to do. And we play a pivotal role in what God is trying to do. And the last little sentence there was really powerful for me. I don't think I'd ever noticed it before, but it said, until we are doing this, we are not fully mature Christians. Do you hear that? Sometimes we think we're fully mature Christians because we go to church, because we read our Bible, because we're nice to people. But what this is saying, is that you're not a fully mature Christian until you have used the gifts that God has given you to the fullest that he has caused you to use them. To me, that was pretty powerful and challenging. And so for some of us in this room, some of you are like, Casey, I know my gifts. I've been using them. I've been, I, I, I took an assessment 10 years ago, and I get that. But um, I guess I found out I was preaching probably two weeks ago, and it was right before we did the pumpkin patch, like unloaded. And um, it hit me on the drive home, something that I'd been feeling while we were unloading. Corey Flores had called probably two weeks before the pumpkin patch and said, hey, I have a friend who's a um, reporter who wants to check out the pumpkin patch, wants to see us unload, wants to write an article. And she said, and, and, I, and she's telling me, and she goes, who do you think would want to do that? And I was like, talk to her and talk to her about it. And I was like, I didn't say me. I was like, you know, um, Leah's our promotional person, but I think Leah was busy. And so she's like, well, maybe Meredith. And I was like, Meredith would love to do that. She's really great at that. Um, and so Meredith took that on. And, uh, but when we were out in the patch, um, she was doing interviews and I saw her doing interviews and I had no desire within me to talk to her at all, like to be interviewed or anything like that. Um, and, it, and so when I'm driving home, I guess because I'm doing this talk, um, I was thinking about it and it was like this aha moment for me because if you had known me in my 20s, you would have known I was an extreme extrovert. I would have loved to be right there being interviewed. I would have loved to have been um, center of attention type person. Um, and God used that for me. Like I, if you had asked me my gifts back then, it would have been evangelism, exhortation. Those would have been what I was gifted at and what I used for God's glory all the time. But it's interesting, as we age, I feel like, this is just my life, but maybe yours too. As we age, if we had li different life experiences, sometimes our giftings change. Not that those other things are gone, but God manifests something new that comes up and bubbles up that is within us. I tell you, while I was driving home, it hit me because I was like, man, um, that, that sounded miserable for me to do that. I was so glad I didn't have to. Um, and so as I was driving home, I realized that, and I've known for quite a few years, that after I had children, I have two teenagers now, but when they were babies, I used to be an extreme extrovert. After I had children, I don't know whether it was because they need you so much. I couldn't even pet our dog because they just suck all the need out of you. And so <laughs> I really felt sorry for our dog. <laughs> but it turned me into an introvert. I mean, truly, I became an introvert. And so I see a mama shaking her head right now. And so 
it really actually changed my giftings, I feel like, too, because as I continued to start using giftings, it was different ones. It was ones where I am totally content being behind the scenes, making sure everything is running well, making sure everything is coming together. I love it. It gives me joy. Um, being upstage is not something I need, um, something God wants, but not something that I need. Um, and so it's... Uh, it was an interesting thing. So I challenge you, if you're sitting here thinking, Casey, I've known my gifts for the past 10, 20 years. If you've had any life changes, if you've gotten married, if your kids have moved out, if you've had a loss, if you've changed careers, um, it could be anything in life that changes us, that affects us, that causes who we are, our personality even sometimes to change. I would encourage you to begin to explore what gifts might be manifesting in you that you don't even realize. And maybe you'll just have an aha moment, kind of like I did, that I'm like, wow, yeah, that is so true. So I do encourage you to start exploring, even if you're a person who has been serving forever. It might be something new that totally surprises you, and it would be a helpful thing for you to know. The other thing that I've noticed about God is that um, sometimes, I call it kind of a holy discontent. Sometimes when we're living our lives, we're doing what God wants for us, we're using our gifts, we get to a place where I feel like we become a little discontent with what we're doing. And sometimes discontentment isn't good, but sometimes I think discontentment can be holy because it can be God placing something in our heart to try to move us in a different direction. I remember this happening to me when we were living in South Carolina and I did pastoral counseling for like, um, I think six years there. And during that time I was having babies and I was raising babies. And so it was the perfect job for me in that season of my life. But um, about five months before we moved, I started having this, this moving in my spirit, this inkling that I wasn't doing what I, all that I should be doing that I have a lot of other gifts other than counseling and that I hadn't been using them for the last six years, hardly at all. And so it was, it was good, but it was still like this feeling of, okay, God, I'm wasting away kind of thing. But it was the right thing because God was giving me this holy discontent to say, I'm moving you out of this. And he totally moved me out of it. He brought me to Westminster where I use all my gifts and some I didn't even know I had. Um, <laughs> When I came along, and um, I had never worked with children, small children. I'd been a youth director, a college minister, and a and person who works within churches, a pastoral counselor, worked with adults, but never small children. In fact, really, I'd never been around them until I had my own. And so um, it was really funny, because when I got here, we had to like transition. And so for a moment, I was helping out with the children's ministry before we hired somebody, and it, it was quite humorous, because I was working totally out of my, my gifting. And it's still not my gifting but I am capable. So I have learned over the last six to seven years, I can plan a kid's camp, truly can plan a children's camp. Um, I need other people to probably be the more fun people, but I can organize and plan one all day long. So as we go into different places, we begin to use different gifts, but I do believe there's that holy discontent that God is sometimes saying to us that causes us to, I hope for all of us to be able to get our minds up and say, why? Why am I feeling not good about what's going on? Why am I wanting to be doing something else? And allow God to speak that into you. Now, I will say, when that happens, sometimes it's really scary. Sometimes it's spiritual gifts that you don't want to use because you're like, no, you know, I did not want to play with children at the time. I mean, sometimes it is just not who you are, but God is saying, yes, I see this in you. I know that you can do it. And even more so, if nothing else, I need you to do this. And so we have to listen and we have to act on faith. And at first, sometimes when you act, you might not enjoy it. It might not be the easiest thing for you, but God will begin to give you your footing and you will see the growth that happens as you continue to work out whatever it is God's doing in your life. The other thing that I've noticed about God is that he, um, when we're not using a gift that maybe we know we have, but we've kind of set it aside. And maybe it was a season to set it aside. But then there's a day that God's like, knocks on your door and says, hey, you know, you're wasting this gift. You need to be using this gift. So I've had that happen just last April. Um, I preached in here last April for Meredith. She was out of town. And to be honest, I've been here, what, eight and a half years, and I've preached maybe twice, and none, I think, since Meredith had been here, because really, it's like kind of like that interview thing. I'm not dying to do it, but if you ask me, I'm happy to do it, you know? Um, and so I, it was a situation where Meredith 
actually needed somebody. And so I was like, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so, um, so I got up here to preach. And actually, when I do preach, I really enjoy it. That's a kicker. Sometimes when you think, uh, you get up and you do your gift, and you're like, oh, that was so fun. And so in April, I preached, and I was like, that was really fun. Um, and so I was, it gave me good joy. And, and I walked away. And as I was driving home that day, God's like, Casey, you are wasting a gift. And you have been wasting it for quite a few years. And so I sat on it for probably two weeks, praying and listening. And finally, I sat with Meredith, and I was like, okay, Meredith, this is what God said to me. I'm convicted. Um, let me step in when you don't want to preach or you're out of town or whatever. And Meredith's like, sure, you can have a sermon, a series. And I was like, all right. So here I am. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, but that's how God works. You know, he speaks to us if we listen. He shows us things. He opens doors, even when you don't want to walk through them, which I didn't, wasn't dying to walk through this one. But he does it, and then God meets you where you're at when you're obedient to walk in faith. And that's the thing that is so important, is to step out in faith. If you'll notice right there on the seats I gave y'all, um, and I never recreate the will, so I got that off the internet, um, that list of spiritual gifts, there's about 18 there. Lots of scholars believe there's about 18 spiritual gifts. Some people believe there's a few more. Some people believe there's a few less in the Bible. Um, some of them look the same, so I think that's why that confusion is there. But there's a good list of 18 spiritual gifts. Um, all of them have scripture next to them, but those last nine actually have definitions next to them. The assessment that Meredith and I have found that actually we feel good about y'all taking and think that it is pretty solid um, has those nine spiritual gifts as what you could, could come out as you take that assessment. And that QR code on that sheet of paper is a QR code to take that free assessment and it will send you your results. Um, I'm dying to know the spiritual gifts of the people in our church. I already know some by seeing what they do, but I would love to know what comes out as you take these assessments. So Meredith and I would love an email for you to send it to us once you've taken us to let us know kind of what came out. If you get take the spiritual gift assessment and you feel like, I don't know about this stuff, or I don't know how to do this to live out what God's showing me, then holler at Meredith, holler at me. We'd love to meet with you. We'd love to talk. I encourage you, this is a way to figure out your spiritual gifts, but I encourage you also to talk to a friend who is discerning and ask them what they see in you and see what they have to say. But the main thing I ask you to do is pray. Ask God to reveal to you what your spiritual gifts are, and then the biggest thing I want you to do, if you take nothing else from this today, I want you to begin to act on what God shows you. Whether God's showing you through an assessment, through just his spirit, whether he's showing you through a friend, whatever it is, take the leap of faith and begin to open your eyes. And I say ask God to open your eyes, to reveal to you the moments where he wants to use your gifts so that you can not just be okay, but be proficient. Because the reality is, it's not about us. It's about God's glory, how other people can see God through us, and growing the kingdom. And if we can keep that in our mind, we will realize that us stewarding these gifts is vitally important. And I really can't wait to see what God's gonna do, because I think it's gonna be exciting. And so we're gonna keep pushing you to begin to explore these things and begin to serve. And you don't have to serve here just at Westminster. There is a whole community out there who needs your gifts because I believe that passage about the whole rhythmic movement isn't just about your church. It's about the whole body of believers all over the world. And so we each have a unique part to play. Let's pray. God, you are good and you are faithful and we are grateful just to be here this morning. Lord, we know that, um, that sometimes we fall short. We know that sometimes we are so busy that we can't hear your voice. And so we don't know what our gifts are because we are not listening. There's too much distracting us. So Lord, I just pray that you allow us to be quiet, to hear your still small voice, to take the time out of our watching TV or even being busy to take an assessment, to begin to seek what it is that you want to do in our lives, Lord. And I pray for miracles. God, I pray that there are people in this room who might get the gift of healing. Lord, I pray for people in this room who might be someone who needs to be a discerning speaker into the lives of the people around them. Father, we pray for people who need to come alongside people who maybe are great at evangelism, but awful at administration, Lord. We pray 
that you put each person in this room and each person in our church in the space to use their gifts fully for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this is the point in our service that we call the offering. And as every week, this is your time to commit your gifts, your prayers, your presence, your service, all of you, all of the things that we have been talking about for four weeks. This is your chance to commit it to God. Uh, This morning, it's a little, we have an additional opportunity for you to commit, which is with these cards. If you didn't bring it with you, there are a bunch of these in the back. Um, We are going to ask you to actually write something down on these cards and to commit it to God. Uh, and here's how that works. You can you can write whatever you feel called to write. Come forward, kneel, place it on. This is our altar. You guys, you guys are in the first service, so the stage is our altar. But tangibly, then put it before the Lord. Um, this particular one is is about money. But when people write financial commitments on this, they all, often will also write whatever word has come up for them about the series as a whole. So maybe um, time or maybe, I don't know. I don't try to decode (laughs) what comes through when we look at these cards later. But this is about all of you. This is about committing all of you to the work of God and um, acknowledging that you are steward and not owner. Um, And so you're going to get a little bit longer. You're going to get a few more minutes than you normally do. And we invite you, however you do this, to take this seriously and to make this your act of worship and your act of commitment and your act of offering. If you're a guest this morning, you are welcome to do it too. Come forward and offer yourself, offer a portion of all that God has entrusted you back to the kingdom of God and take that to whatever community you're in, whatever community of faith that you are committed to. I commit to the work of God through the community of faith that I am in, a portion of all that God has given me my time, my talents, my gifts, my service, my witness. As a side note, you will see me doing this too. Um, People get surprised when pastors turn in giving cards um, because it seems a bit circular. But in fact, it's because this is not about fundraising. This is about spiritual gifts, right? If it were about fundraising, it would not make sense for me to give to the institution that pays me. But it's not about fundraising. It is about the fact that a portion of my income is committed back to the work of God regardless of where that is coming from. And so you see the Mills family. We talked about this this week. We prayed about it this week. And the Mills family is going to, along with the rest of the family of of Westminster, make our commitment to God for 2024. So for about two to five minutes, in your hearts, um, give yourself, offer yourself, make your act of worship to the God who gave everything to you.
can do all things The source of my life I will stand upon your word Knowing you have heard my cry Oh Lord most high For in you I can do all things For the source of my life I will stand upon your word Knowing you have heard my cry Oh, Lord, most high In the shadow of your Every knee shall bow and tongue confess that you are Lord, Lord most high. Every knee shall bow and tongue confess that you are Jesus, I say Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple quick announcements. I'm going to invite Bruce to come forward. We have a celebratory breakfast in the pumpkin patch just before the good weather gets here. Um, we are going to do that this morning. He's going to say a few words about it. The weather is palatable. I'm going to announce that first. So please come join us. Uh, it, it, this is an affair that is entirely about fellowship. There is uh, no speeches, nothing to do but enjoy yourselves. Um, breakfast tacos, cookies with the logo of our stewardship campaign, uh, coffee and water. There are two uh, opportunities 
Uh, there's a craft opportunity. Yes, gentlemen, you're going to be involved in this too. You create your own stained glass window. Um, but it's, it's a cool piece of art, so please join up with us. And we also have an interactive opportunity where we're going to each have our piece of stained glass uh, representing our own presence, prayers, gifts, service, witness uh, that we will combine together to combine into the logo of this year's stewardship campaign. So please join us right after the service on the front lawn. Amen. Couple more announcements. I'm going to make them really quick so we can all get outside. Um, first of all, we have a new men's Bible study kicking off this week, this Wednesday. So we have, for those of you who don't know, we have a fantastic men's Bible study that meets 7 a.m. on Fridays. It is, it is wonderful. It is one of the strongest groups in the church. Um, it has not only discipled people, um, it has changed lives. It has been a support structure for so, so many guys. Um, and it is when I say it, this is one of the strongest groups in the church that I know if I send somebody there, they're going to be welcomed, they're going to be discipled, they're going to be challenged, they're going to be supportive. It's also at 7 a.m., which is real early. Um, and there are a number of people that I sent there that were like, you know, Meredith, if it were not at 7 o'clock on a Friday morning. <laughs> so we're starting, at, we're starting another one. Um, in, in their words, they're franchising. And uh, they are... Uh, extending the goodness of the Friday morning into Wednesday evening, which is a much more palatable time option. So if you, um, if you're a guy, if you're looking for a place to plug in, if you're looking for kind of a support, growth, discipling, um, no girls allowed kind of place, this is a fantastic opportunity. It's this Wednesday at time 6 30, 630. Um, and it's going to keep going. So if you can't make it this week, just reach out to Casey and she can get you plugged into the people who've signed up. And, um, and we hope that gets growing because, because uh, it's, it's a fantastic group. And the more groups that, like that that we have in Westminster, the stronger the community is. Second announcement, December 10th. Everybody put that on your calendar. December 10th at 630 is our church Christmas party. This is going to be the most fun Christmas party you go to all season long. Um, it, is, it is, in all seriousness, it's a lot of fun. It's fellowship. It's a chance to hang out with each other. The reason I want you to put it on your calendar is that it's a Sunday night this year instead of a Thursday night. Um, and so I want you to get that in your head early because we would love everyone to sign up. Um, it has been so much fun in years past. Again, it's just an opportunity to hang out have fun. We have childcare available, so you do not have to have your kids with you. Um, it's a great chance to just meet other people and, and hang out and have some, some really, really fun times. So December 10th, make sure to get it on your calendar. Is that it? Is that our only announcements? We're collecting clothes for the homeless in the month of November. Yes? Uh, yes, warm. Sorry, I'm getting on the microphone so we can get in the um, in the video. So warm weather, warm clothes drive for the homeless in the month of November. You can bring it by the church office all month long. Okay, Tracen, did you have something? Okay, uh, so I'm going to do the benediction and then I'm going to trace in one more one more minute. Um, my brothers and sisters, go forth in peace and go forth in grace. Go forth in love. Go forth in strength and wisdom and in the power and presence of God. Go forth knowing that you have been gifted, you have been called, you have been equipped, and you are necessary and useful in the kingdom of God. And in so knowing, go forth covered in grace in all that you do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.